My name is Joe Wooden from Tory. Welcome to our vlog series on all things design. Uh, today I'm joined by Myob's head of SME design, Megan Waters. Megan has an incredible history in design with the last almost 12 years working for one of the most well-respected IT consultancies, ThoughtWorks, where she has designed market-disrupting software, managed the design, development and strategy of new we uh, a new website for the National Breast Cancer Centre, and developed online strategy information architecture for several household brands. Thank you for joining us this morning, Megan. How are you? Good, Joe. Quite well. On a beautiful sunny day in Sydney, which is a rarity. So, True. Oh, I've heard it was chat. four degrees in Melbourne this morning. So, uh, There are reasons I don't live in Melbourne anymore. <laughs> uh, you're originally from Melbourne, so you've suffered through the, the cold winters. No, but I um I'm originally from Sydney and I keep coming back. But I actually did, you know, and we're talking about, you know, like how did I get into this and everything like that. My original degree is in architecture and it's from Melbourne Uni. So I did like, ah. at, down at Melbourne Uni for um so I lived in Melbourne for a few years then and um also in one of my kind of earlier uh design jobs when I worked for um IBM GSA on the Telstra Telstra, Ooh. which is you know, a long time ago. If anyone knows knows those brands, well, no, everyone knows Telstra, IBM, GSA. Which, you know. oh, very cool. Look, Melbourne is an amazing place when it's warm. There is so much happening, um, but going into the winter, it just slows right down. It's just cold. <laughs> so I don't know how else to explain it? It's just cold, and there's not much happening. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, no, I just don't want to go outside. Pretty much. It's uh, what yeah. everyone seems. But let's just jump straight well, into it. So yeah. I'm very keen to hear a bit more about your career journey as a designer. ThoughtWorks I've known for many, many years. Um, and they've, I guess, always been brought in to, I guess, save sort of pieces of work. Uh, so it's it's an exciting company to work for. Tell us about your experience. Yeah, look, it was. I mean, as I said, it was you know close to to twelve years in, um, and sort of split a bit. I uh, did seven years on the consulting side, and five years I worked in house. Um, uh, ended up as their head of product design, product and design for um, what's called tech ops. They're kind of technical operations, and because of um, ThoughtWorks being the kind of company that they are, of course, you know, your internal IT, you don't just buy it. Of course, you have to build a whole bunch as well. And, yeah, so it was was negotiating through there. So it was a great way of kind of getting that in-house experience as well as the, the consulting. But most of my career has ended up in consulting, although often for sort of longer gigs, um, which is because a lot of my focus has ended up being on kind of what you call, like, I've labelled in my head business critical systems, like you know all the stuff that that it's not particularly sexy, it's not particularly flashy, and God knows if that's you know it is not relying on my close to non-existent visual design skills, um, but it's uh, you know it's it's like the early things in my career were um, moving call center software, taking that movement from green screen to GUIs graphical user interfaces so you know <laughs> I know I'm aging myself out here <laughs> but yeah look as I said my I um so I trained originally as an architect and that was what I was going to be and and then you know and I got my my first degree in it and did my years work experience I was heading back into that second degree because if anyone's ever done architecture it's a long torturous experience to label yourself as an architect um and it was sort of midway through that second degree and I go you know there's 50 percent unemployment in the field at this point in time and all the architects I know sort of have you know they they mostly talk with other architects they marry other architects they have little architect babies it's kind of this very and I realize that's not actually um what drives me like I like kind of that broader looking at all the different factors that that come into play and trying this out and not doing this and that's harder in building you know because buildings take a certain amount of time and through a range of bizarre side tracks and everything like that I ended up in um well that time user-centered design user experience design I don't know I've been through so many label changes on the whole thing over the course of the year and then you know ended up and so that's kind of been the last 20 odd years of my career has been in this whole field of user experience design but I'm much more on that that 
interaction, user research, service design kind of field, which is why I made that dip for a while into product management for those business critical systems. It's kind of the, the internal facing systems, not, not kind of that consumer facing. So, yeah, did that did. roughly like, sum up? What the this hell? Is a, <laughs> this is a personal question, but like I, I'm interested, obviously, uh, ThoughtWorks being very heavy on the engineering side. Um, did you have to do a lot of stakeholder management to sell design internally or were they very on board with when you were going to a, a critical systems project to go, all right, we need to apply design thinking to this before we actually start building or like, how did it how, how did it work? Yeah. I've uh, almost all of my career has been in tight collaboration with um, developers along the way. So I've, I've sort of always worked in that way. So for me, it seemed much more natural, but you did have to overcome people's view because, you know, different designers work in different ways and everyone's experience and you know how fluid this field is. And so everyone's view on what is design has been built on kind of the last to designers they had any interaction with, which, you know, can range from, you know, people who are really doing, you know, very focused on the visual design and potentially, you know, more, more kind of straightforward website marketing kind of world through to, you know, like full in, all in service design. So it depends where you, where you So I had some people who are like super, like absolutely, yes, in boots and all from the very beginning and others where it's like you would find yourself getting left out of conversations because you're going like no i think it's you know oh no 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 we don't need design until later and so yeah okay okay let's let's have a let's wind this back a little bit and talk and i think but part of it is just push you know that's with some of those bills just sort of pushing yourself into those conversations and going awesome but if i get the context then quite frankly, better decisions can be made down the track. And what you found was that um, design brings such a, a different lens onto things and generally a lot more of that sort of outside in looking into, into projects and solutions and everything like that, that you are quickly demonstrating value. You know, you go, but yeah, and, and you know, people are sort of going down these particular paths and it's like, but hang on, what about if we just, go back and and sort this through and what's really that problem that we're trying to understand and you know, all of these sorts of things come into play so I think it's a little bit different and I think that's why you know people you often read um uh, oh you need to do these things you know to get design ahead of the table I think it is so so contextual to the experience of the people that you're working with and their past experience and and so I don't think there's a one way suits everybody kind of is that just did it you find that it really helps round your skill set, obviously being able to go into several organisations, understanding how they're actually interacting with design um, so you can see the different outcomes. If someone's doing it poorly or someone's doing it well, how, how quickly and effectively you can create change. Did you, was it nice seeing that sort of, I guess, over overview of it all? <laughs> um, it's nice making uh stuff happen and changing people's view who do have that that kind of very much design is an afterthought view and being able to demonstrate no we can make significant changes and speed up sometimes you can really speed up things by by bringing that view in um i most of my work was away ah oh, you know, it was a little bit split sorry i was going to say most of my work was on projects so you're, you're sort of working through and generally you're in there with a team that's already been convinced and a lot of my time at ThoughtWorks I was already relatively experienced and, and senior so you sort of come in with that that um, that background that lent, lent white into there um, so so but it was great it was one of those great Things. A lot of designers tend to be facilitators as well because we do do a lot of that, that sort of bringing stuff together. So it, it's always that joy of just being going, able to go in and use those skills and that, that looking at a more holistic view of the problem to really move the project along and move the team along. Um, and uh, so as, as part of that journey, probably my first gig with, with um ThoughtWorks was at NBN in the early days 
And from early success in those projects, I ended up setting up their um, sort of uh, customer experience team in the design sense of the word, not in the sales and support sense of the word, um, team for them and everything because it was that value and we could work that in in the whole digital experience for NBN before various changes happened. Crazy in the NBN world. Don't complain to me about your broadband speeds. But... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, and that was great to see that working and to just people getting it and getting it because they could see the value in it, not from, you know, some PowerPoint presentation, but that on the ground, like, this is the skills that design brings into the creation of experiences. Yeah. Okay. Well, leading to your role, um, we are at my uh, heading SME. What, what inspired you to actually take the journey to move into a, a leadership capacity? Yeah, well, I, um, I'd, uh, so as I said, for so five years I worked internal in ThoughtWorks and three of those was as that head of product and design and I just really enjoyed that kind of, which was that it's much more like being in-house than consulting um, and I really, really enjoyed the evolution of that role into that leadership of being able to kind of look at a much more holistic picture and that strategic kind of picture in there and um, then also have the, the the tools to hand, you know, people, time, money, all that to hand to be able to start to move on those strategies. You know, it never goes as fast as you want. You know, you, you make mistakes, you have to live with those mistakes, but it was that, that nice because one of the challenges about being a consultant and even me and I used to work longer um, gigs was that you know you do this stuff and then you never kind of see where it went and where that that sort of kept going to and this gave that 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 ability to really bring all that training and experience in kind of design thing and everything to bear even into things like organizational design and looking at that service design and all those aspects of it and bringing um, an entire chunk of an organization along with you on that journey and help to make those changes and just bring a different viewpoint into it um, and improve what the outcome is and how that's approached. So I really liked that, but it was a global role. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do a global role out of Sydney, but, you know, <laughs> after, after a year or so of being on the phone till midnight, um, three or four nights a week, it was like... Okay, so I moved back into consulting for a while and, and sort of thought leadership in there, um, in that whole sort of um, internal facing product management space. And I went, well, this is kind of fun, but it's not. I really enjoyed that more having, having a say into the strategy and that implementation. And so when the role kind of came up at, at, at MYAB and I started talking to people then, it was like, no, I just... I liked it. I liked the team. I liked the direction that they were going, and that that thought of I could get in there and make that that move, and that they saw design as being a critical part in there. So, in fact, um, uh, just recently my my role changed a bit, and I should have updated you on it, Joe. Sorry. Um, so I'm now sort of uh, head of experience design for across MYAB as a whole. So the sorry, regional well, focus. Take back my introduction. <laughs> congratulations no. that's exciting it is it is it's a little bit terrible you go well what's the difference because um uh small, small medium enterprise is a big part of MIB's business um so I already had a, a, a quite a broad remit in there to, to think about well what's the the experiences we're looking to create and this kind of just spreads it out a bit further across the rest of it so so which is fun yeah fun so far it's like, you know, well, it's scary, but, you know. I've seen that I, I worked with MIB. It must have been like 10. Oh, well, Jesus, it makes me sound old now. Ah, uh, 12 <laughs> or 13 years ago. And, like, it's been an incredible journey to watch them come from what they were as a, a normal accounting software back in the day to where they are now. Now one of those cool brands that people want to come and work at, whereas back in the day they were just another of accounting software that you'd install on your PC. On your PC and the desktop. Yeah. And it's it's a challenge. It's a 
big challenge around how do you keep how do you deal with that heritage? And I think there are a number of companies that are going through this where, they, you know, they were at one point kind of at the, this forefront of this whole digital thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, yes. <laughs> you know? and it's, but it's 30 years. And so there's all this, this kind of heritage attached in there. And it's like, how do you do it? How do you deal with it? And um, so, yeah, so it's been been really fascinating going, seeing where they've come from, where we're going now and that that movement around and, you know, people keep talking about, no, we need to shed the brown cardigan um, <laughs> image and uh, one of our heads of product was going, but I have a brown cardigan. And I said, yeah, I bet you it's a really nice kind of chocolate brown cashmere, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there are some brown cardigans that are worthwhile keeping. <laughs> Well, I'll leave that to you guys, but um, it's <laughs> aren't my thing. Um, I'm interested. Let's see what happens again. Or we'll have to reinvent ourselves when Web 3.0 uh, comes out, but who knows what that's going to bring. But um, moving on to the next question, uh, I guess as your journey getting to experience so much as a consultant and obviously in-house, has it helped shape you as a design leader or just as a designer? Is there any like piece of advice that you've been given that's really stuck <laughs> a few things over the, over the course and I think the the one that's really resonated over the last few years is that fall in love with the problem not the solution like you know I think we've seen that one float around and it's like yes yes and the other the other one um, you know I've got a few of them the other one that's really saying was um you know there was this whole trip going around a while ago around everyone's a designer Everyone's a designer. It was like, oh God, I feel the need to punch someone. Um, you know, because it's not, it's a skill set, it's a trained skill set, and you know, people think about it a lot. And then I heard it reframed as everyone's making design decisions. Some people are just a lot better for it at it and trained at it. And it's and I think that really resonated with me as well as that way of going, no, everyone is making design decisions. So how do we help everyone to make better ones? And how do we make sure that um, as designers we're in there at the on the table for those really complicated design decisions and those really risky ones where where you know you bring a whole bunch of, of expertise to the table. So those were were sort of operating as that designer, I think. Um, and then operating kind of as that that leader, a couple of things in there. And um, one of them weirdly goes right back to my architecture days, which was um, remember your brief, like kind of make sure you keep the focus where you need to do because particularly as you move into leadership roles, you know, there's, there's, there's a million things you could be looking at and you get a much bigger picture on all the problems and all the things that you could be looking at. And it's like you've got to give yourself and work through some boundaries um, and appropriate ones and, and permeable and almost, you know, permeable ones, but you need to know roughly where they are so you can start to be effective. Um, and I think also speak up and think about your audience you're doing. And I think that's that that key thing because often I feel as designers we're, we're trained to look at all the different viewpoints and ways that people could come at things. And we bring this through a lot. And so you sort of, you know, that's what's that, you know, the classic, the thing that you always say, and you think that you never should, you know, it depends. And it's like, yeah, nobody wants to hear it depends. So it's like, how do you start to reframe that language so that it you can make it work with, um, you know, with your stakeholders or, you know, your audiences that you're trying to deal with. So And, and also to just speak up and have a viewpoint in there and, and realise that your viewpoint extends beyond you know, maybe just a, a workflow or something. It extends into the organisation. You have all these skills that can move further forward. So I think those are kind of the pieces that keep resonating and I come back to again and again for me. It's, uh, it seems to be a very common thread from a lot of the conversations that I have is it's great to be able to do good design, but you also have to be able to communicate it and explain why. Um, and if you can't do that, that's half the job. So sometimes you point that is missed exactly exactly it's it's you know great design in and of itself is is mostly it's for your own enjoyment until it actually hits the the you know until the the rubber hits the road 
of, yeah. of it actually in people's hands. I mean, in the areas that I work in, if it's not in someone's hands and it's not being used, because the other one, you know, the other great definition of design that I like is, you know, design is the rendering of intent. And unless you've actually made that rendering and it's being used, it's the rest is just, uh, it was a lovely time everyone had, you know, it was kind of, but it's <laughs> not, not achieving what you need. Yeah. yeah. I'll ask the next question by pre-framing something you just said anyway. Um, everyone is making design decisions, but some people are better at it and are trained at it. So what skills and attributes do you think make a better designer? Or designer. <laughs> 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 Look, and I'm, I'm going to speak from, from uh, you know, uh, where my sort of skill set of design is, which we talked about earlier you know it's it's kind of that service design interaction design and, and things and I um for me there are a couple of really key things one is that um training in kind of top down bottom up thinking which was really strongly reinforced in architecture like you need a vision darling, a vision you know and you need to have a like you know a great statement around what it is that you're trying to achieve but that needs to be a reflection of the people that you're working for like you know who's going to be using it and at the same time in the architecture sense you know you need to know that a brick is this size by this size by this size and if you want to go off piece from that it's going to start to cost you a lot more money and you know you can only take this much structural weight and all those so you need to hold both of those in 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 your head at the same time and bring them together to make the thing that it is that you're you're trying to create in whatever way so i think that's that for me has been one of the key skills that I learned and the key thing to bring through. Um, and I think that focus on also um, it's not what we want to do as the team creating an experience, it's what people need and want and, you know, what sort of pains are you addressing? What are they going to get out of it? What's that value proposition? And kind of because Essentially, if, if any of the aspect of, of what you're trying to achieve involves people's behaviour changing, then you really know to know what those people's behaviours are and what it is that you're trying to affect and keep that in mind all the time. And I think that's, that's one of those huge skills that we bring in because um, so many other skill sets are kind of focused on that sort of that inside out thinking as opposed to we really often and should bring in that outside in thinking. To question it so those are probably the two that i think are super important do you find with um i guess junior or mid designers that are really good at the craft um sometimes it's a bit of a getting them to take a step back with their ego uh and understand that they aren't uh i guess designing just for themselves it's actually designing for the user i <laughs> i haven't had so much of that recently i think it very much used to be a lot of a lot would turn up and people would want to really create kind of the the perfect experience um but i've been i've both been fairly fortunate in my career and worked with uh, so many fabulous designers and there there often is that that kind of that piece oh no we need to know you know, we need to go and see and put this in users' hands. You know, let's let's go test this prototype. Let's go understand what it is. Let's let's look at this. Um, so I've almost more seen it where people get a little bit sort of finicky about it and a wanting to test either test everything to death or going no 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 it has to be this and it has to be this and we've got to sort of craft this whole perfect experience all the way down and sort of breaking them of that kind of mindset and going no trust yourself enough to get things into people's hands earlier when it's not perfect you don't have to be perfect and i think that's that's almost been that 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 piece of um uh it is often that fear and i still do encounter it where people are like no i don't want anyone to see it until it's perfect I don't want the team and it's like it's never going to be perfect abandon that thought like get it out there and it will be better so yeah that that's more the issue i've run into with Oh, yeah, I don't think that's a design problem. I think that's just a, no. a problem. <laughs> uh, I know I do that in many areas of my life. It's like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to like put this out in people's faces yet. Let's, let's work on it a little bit more. 
don't we all, you know? Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. But then I'm just like, well, I've, I've watched I've watched too many opportunities go by, both both for myself personally and for, for other people that I've worked with because they've been worried about it not being absolutely right. And, and look, you know, it's always a judge because I've also seen people go out with really early stuff and then they've just been smacked over the back of their head yep. for the fact that it's really <laughs> early thinking. So, you know. I suppose it that is, judgment is isn't it of reading yeah what if you the timing timing sometimes helps a lot but yeah yeah exactly so That's very interesting wow um I love speaking to people that have been in the industry uh and watched it sort of progress because you, you've seen it from when it sort of started to where it is now and design is such an important part of everything we do now um what trends do you see emerging in the design space at the moment you're keeping an eye on or interested in it's it's an interest i mean i think we're all interested in you know what what's the impact of you know covid and all the lockdowns and the isolation and the remote working and and it's like what what challenges are that is that going to bring to the whole world in in how what it is that we're designing what it is that we're creating how people are living their lives i mean mine are the things that i kind of keeping an eye on because and sort of more in that that kind of the human behaviour space and and where that's going. Um, but even like design as a craft, the things that I think that are emerging as design as a craft and getting stronger, um, much, much more common now for teams to be set up as cross-functional collaborative teams with design firmly embedded and seeing that even further extending through and um, I loved it that you shared the uh, McKinsey report, the design report, which I'd, I'd actually read like probably about a week before that. And it was like they're going, yes, you know, the more collaboration and cross-functional teams are, it seems to have that, you know, better impact on business performance. But is everyone sort of making that space? And I think we're seeing a lot more of that um, uh, people having more cross-functional skill sets coming through as well as working in cross-functional teams um, and getting that diversity of, of thought. Um, but I think in the way that we approach design as well um, is that that it's becoming clearer and clearer as everyone understands that you don't have a captive audience, that your audience has um, easy access to a range of technologies and different systems and different ways of approaching it and you've got to meet them where they're at and I think that that also stems in one of the the pieces is we're seeing that further and further emerge is the designing for connections mm. like of knowing and, and it's this big thing to get into people's heads because you're working on something and and it consumes a hundred percent of your time and energy and you're just sort of really in there and it's like getting everyone aware that while it's 100% of your world to your audience, it's maybe, you know, 2%. If you're lucky, it's 10%, you know, if you're in business. And and I think it's that people are becoming more and more used to that fact that I can bring in all these different pieces from other companies, from other technologies, from other applications, and I can attempt to join them all up together to myself as a user. And I think that leads to that overarching um the consumerization of business software because that's always been my my interest is that that whole you know business critical systems um seeing that that expectations of our consumer world bleeding into the work world and that moving of it becoming more and more consumer focused so those are some of the the big things that i suppose are just on on my head and i think it is that um, realising that everyone is already embedded in, in these pieces and how do you change people's behaviours? Change management is one of the yeah. big things. And I think it's a design problem. Like we often tend to think design sort of in the box of what it is that you're building. And I think to be good at design and to think about it, you've got to kind of get further out into yeah. and actively change people's behaviors or you know attempt to at least make it possible for them i don't know you know one of those things god knows you know i feel i can't even you know change the behavior of my two teenagers how am i going to change the behavior oh, i've got a three-year-old so, trying to change oh, jesus. The behavior. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about this with my team this morning i was like how do i 
how do I get her to do things without trying to like bribe her with other things? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Parenting's <laughs> challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it really, is. So, yeah, so no great startling revelation because that is the other side of, you know, like having had a career this long and, you know, people go, oh, do you think this is going to be the next big thing? And it's like I've lived through so many next big things. Yeah. Like, I don't even know and I reckon the next big thing will come from somewhere where no one's really expecting it. True, yeah, yeah, true. You know, like, SMS uh, came blinding us out of the side, you know, when it first true. came up. Now there's a long, long, long ago. I'm really ageing myself now. SMS, well, yeah, it's... And still people don't use it properly, but now governments send us spammy messages all the time trying to get votes, so uh, <laughs> oh. <seems> to work. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, like, I've noticed come up quite a lot and that I'm genuinely interested in is, is the focus on capturing audiences and sort of building the communities around that because um, I guess people are becoming a little bit more open to jumping from something like one software to another software because it's a lot easier these days and i think obviously that's what web 3.0 is trying to sort of solve there it's it's making it a little bit easier for people just to go all right i'm just going to take my stuff over here um so it's going to be interesting how design plays into that um to really keep audiences engaged yeah yeah as i said to recognize you don't have a captive audience anymore you cannot rely on that so, yeah. So how do you engage them? How do you keep people wanting to use your stuff? How do you create things that people want to buy, whether with their time or their money or, as we've seen, you know, with their personal information um, versus things that you have to sell? So it's always Good a challenge. Question. I saw a post the other day and it was saying that TikTok now has like 10 times you more users than both Instagram and Facebook are. My numbers are probably pretty far off, but TikTok is just dominating because people just want to watch short videos apparently. So it's like, apparently. Well, the Instagram has become such a huge, that was the other one, like Instagram has become this huge commercial platform without actually taking money. But the amount of artists and stuff who sell through Instagram and have kind of cut out that gallery piece and the creation of your own audience is I don't think anyone, I don't think the Instagram people's, you know, thought that that was going to be the case when they they built that platform. But yeah, no, I so I'm a pretty basic Instagram user, but being in Bali, everyone actually uses Instagram as a business. So like to search yeah. a business, you have to go on Instagram and find them, and that's how you interact with them, and then use WhatsApp yep. chat. And I'm just like, all right, I'm too far behind the times apparently. <laughs> trying to stay away from social media and then I am forced to be there anyways. Because so. <laughs> otherwise you can't find me. Yeah. Megan, no, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, if people yeah. want to connect or reach out to you, is it just best to message you on LinkedIn? Yeah, that's probably the easiest. I do have a, a Twitter handle, but I, honest to God, I don't use it that often. So LinkedIn's always the easiest way. Excellent. Well, once again, it's been a pleasure. So thank you so much for spending your time today. And once again, congratulations on the promotion at my <laughs> Thanks so much, Joe. It was great. It was great to chat. It was.